urban legends, mythical creatures, disturbing cryptids. Today's episode is all about real-life encounters with things that seem to have emerged straight from folklore itself. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, and you can follow me on Twitter at Dark Prevails to see a terrifying video of a tornado forming right on top of someone's car mid-drive. Enjoy these allegedly true and scary folklore stories, and be sure to send me your scary stories at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. Give me all your state park stories soon. Also, go to eeriecast.com for more creepy and free shows like this. Now, let's begin. Camping Tales from Grade 7 From Anonymous I live in Australia, and my school was pretty big on doing campouts and such. They had taken us out to some camping grounds at the base of a mountain. When we arrived, there was no one else there. We set up our tents and found the toilet block up a driveway. That first night, something strange happened. I woke up seemingly for no reason. As I struggled to go back to sleep, I heard heavy breathing right outside our tent. It was right next to my head. I looked over to my best friend. She was also in the tent with me but she was fast asleep with her mouth closed. The heavy breathing was not coming from her, not to mention I'd been awake for about 30 minutes before I heard that breathing. The tents made quite a bit of noise when they were unzipped, yet I'd heard no one else unzip their tent. Whoever, whatever was outside, they were not part of my class. I was paralyzed, lying there praying that it would leave. I was scared it would open the tent and take me and my best friend. But after what seemed like forever, it finally went away. I never heard it walk away, it simply faded away. The following morning I told all my friends what happened, but they all said the breathing was probably my friend sleeping next to me. The following night my friend needed to use the bathroom, but I didn't want to leave the tent. It was very early in the morning when she had to get up, but there was a bit of light out. I forced myself to get up to join her. As soon as we step outside the tent, we see this massive footprint, followed by a tiny one. They didn't appear to be from separate creatures, but one. Something with one large foot and one tiny one. They were the only footprints on the dewy grass. My friend tried to ignore the weirdness of the situation, claiming it was one of the guys playing a prank. I pointed out that there were no return footprints, so how did the guys get back to their tent? She ignored me and started walking up the dirt driveway. That's when we hear this ear-shattering shriek. We were both immediately on edge. We continued up the driveway, slowly, quietly. As we turned the corner, we saw what caused the shriek. There were three freshly killed possums in a line on the road. Blood seeped out of their necks. My best friend turned to me asking if I think a dingo did that. I shook my head. There weren't dingoes around these parts. If there were, there would be a warning at the entrance of the campgrounds. My friend was now panicking. Then what did that? She asked. I don't know. I still don't know. We made it to the bathrooms, and as we began to walk back, we bumped into a woman. She appeared to be in her thirties. She smiled at us and walked into the bathroom. As we walked back, I realized I didn't know where she could have come from. The only people at the camping grounds were from our school. There were no other tents or caravans in the open space, and the grounds weren't that big. They were surrounded by mountains, creeks, and national parks. We would have seen her tent or caravan. But no, there was nothing no one knew there. To this day, I've never told anyone about the woman, or the possums. Menehune in Hilo, Hawaii From Sea Philly 100 Hilo is the easternmost city on the Big Island, which is the easternmost island on the Hawaiian archipelago. Vastly different from the semi-arid Kona side, Hilo is a lush, tropical climate 
teeming with pristine virgin rainforest and wild jungle terrain. This encounter took place some 20 miles north of town at Uma Uma Falls State Park. There is a very sketchy route you can take to get out on top of the falls, but it is extremely treacherous and I would in no way, shape, or form recommend it. So with that said, don't try this at home. Imagine if you would a 300-foot waterfall cascading down into a severe jungle basin, chock full of bamboo forest, coconut groves, and wild ginger. This story is told from the perspective of my friend from Hilo. Let's call her Jessie. I arrived at the trailhead right around dusk as I was trying to catch the sunset out there. So I hurriedly gathered my things before throwing them in my day pack and hitting the trail. Right around 200 yards in or so, you can cut off to the left and get up on the ridge line, leading down to the waterfall. So I hung a left and started climbing up into the dense jungle foliage. It was slow going through the bamboo thicket, but I gradually made my way out into this raw, exposed patch of hillside. It was incredibly steep, with nothing but ginger roots for handholds. To slip and fall would surely mean death here, and I remember thinking at the time, if I die, at least it's one heck of a way to go. Sweat beating on my brow, I finally crossed the open field, and I found a nice little ledge to post up on at the base of a cliffside. I stopped there to sit and rest for a while, enjoying one of the most brilliant sunsets I've ever seen in my life. Deep, majestic hues of purple and pink that we just don't get back on the mainland. I was taking a moment to collect myself when a tiny little pebble hit me square on the top of my head before bouncing off down the hillside. What the? Another pebble bounced off the top of my head. Hey, cut it out, cut it out. I shouted. What puzzled me, though, was how someone could even really climb up above where I was perched. It was simply too dangerous. I stood up shakily and tried to look around. I didn't see anyone. The light was failing fast, so I started making my way back out across the open field. I was about halfway across said field when something caught my eye. I almost would have missed it, except for the fact that it moved slightly, kicking loose a bit of dirt and causing me to look up. What I'm about to say is going to sound crazy, but there it was, this little person standing there. Only they looked more like a garden gnome than anything. He was quite short, probably right around a foot and a half, two feet tops. The first thing I noticed were his eyes. They were small and black, but full of curiosity almost as if he was seeing something brand new for the first time, trying to process what it meant to him. He had this stubby little nose and pointed ears that sat very close to his head, suggesting the appearance of two small pointy horns. His mouth was closed, but I could see two tiny little teeth sticking up over his upper lip, right where the canines would be in a human mouth. He wore braided leaves for clothes covering his tiny body and providing the perfect camouflage. His skin tone was a dark tan, but covered with what appeared to be elaborate stick-and-poke tattoos. He had a small pouch slung over his left shoulder, and he was holding a tiny little walking stick with an arrowhead on the top in his right hand. I went to shift my weight when suddenly he turned heel and sprinted up into the forest so fast it was hard for my eyes to track giving him the appearance of a trippy little blur. It took me a minute to get over my shock, but it was now pretty dark, and I knew I didn't have much time left. I shimmied across the sketchy traverse, praying not to lose my grip. I finally made it back to the bamboo thicket, breathing a sigh of relief before entering the darkened grove. Ouch! Ouch. Something pinched my ankle. I looked down, just in time to see a tiny little arm recoiling back into the shadows. Leave me alone, Leave me alone. I screamed. It was insanely steep, and I knew if I fell, it was more than likely no one would ever find my body. Heck, no one even knew I was out there. What an idiot, I thought, chastising my entire life's choices leading me to this precise point in time. Not to mention I was distinctly aware of tiny little bodies moving through the bamboo. <laughs> Another pinch, this time on the small of my back, 
I turned around to the sight of one of those little buggers running off into the forest. Hey, you little, hey, jerk, little jerk, I exclaimed. That hurt. That hurt. That hurt. That was it. I knew I had to haul tail back to the car. I began jumping from pole to pole through the bamboo, only pausing to swat at the occasional hand poking out from in between the branches. I could hear this weird high-pitched laughter all around me, as well as the sound of broken pigeon and native Hawaiian, though I couldn't make out the dialect. I was crying by then. I truly thought I was going to die, and those painful pinches just kept on coming. The laughter was at a fever pitch now, like these little guys were all riled up whooping and hollering and carrying on. At last, I finally broke free of the bamboo thicket before sprinting back down to the trailhead. I fumbled for my keys, jamming the key in the keyhole and throwing the door open to my car. I briefly turned back to see the bamboo shaking violently. I jumped in my car to the course of those little pebbles raining down from overhead. I turned the key in the ignition and went bouncing down the road back down to Hilo, silently mouthing what the heck the entire way back. It took me a while to talk about it, but when I did, I was confounded by the rather casual, matter-of-fact attitude that people seemed to have about my strange encounter. Oh yeah, but Minehune, they would say. I looked it up and apparently the Minehune are essentially the Hawaiian equivalent of Irish leprechauns and predate the Polynesian settlers there. Highly efficient hunters and trappers, they build complex traps for wild boar and crafty little fish ponds to capture fish. They tend to prefer remote jungle terrain far away from humans, but they have been known to make their presence felt when defending their territory. There's actually some really cool academic research regarding these little fellows, as well as several other forest-dwelling Hawaiian races. The Nawao, who are large-sized wild hunters descended from Lua Nu'u, the Mu people, and the Wa people. My understanding is that some of these creatures are similar to Australian howlies or Vietnamese rock apes. Overall, I wasn't too scared. Rather, I was fascinated by the ordeal as a whole, and I've actually been back to that spot a couple of times. Unfortunately, I haven't seen those little dudes again. Or at least, not yet, anyway. My Sister and the Vampire From Anonymous You know, I never really thought I'd be sitting down writing an experience like this that involved me. But after a while had passed since this incident, I figured now I can tell this story. Now I should explain that I'm adopted. My parents were both unfit to be, well, parents. And so my aunt and her wife both adopted me and took me in as their own when I was about 12. Being adopted, I gained a brother and two sisters. My brother Roger was a marine and was constantly away. My sister Felicia lived about six hours away from us. My sister Crystal was the only one of my aunt's wife's kids to live nearby. Anyway, at the time of this story, I was a senior in high school. It was winter break and I couldn't wait to relax for two whole weeks. Being the loner I was, I decided to stay home all break. My days mainly consisted of binge watching Netflix and playing a crap ton of video games. That's just how I liked it, staying up until 5 a.m., then sleeping until 2 in the afternoon. One afternoon, I woke up to loud knocking at my door and the calling of my name. I reply with a groggy, yeah. Crystal's going to be staying the night with her kids while me and Sherry hang with an old friend tonight. My aunt explained and walked away. Great, I thought. Me and Crystal didn't hate each other, we just didn't have a single thing in common so we didn't have much of a relationship. She was really into witchcraft and voodoo stuff, stuff I thought was just junk she wouldn't let go of from her goth days in high school. She always seemed so normal during the day, but at night she'd get really weird and start blabbering on about summoning things. I never gave it too much thought, other than she's probably crazy. 6pm comes around, and I hear my sister Crystal and her kids swing by. I happened to be eating cereal on the couch when they came in, so I greeted them right away. Hey guys, I say as pleasantly as I can. The kids respond with their cheerful noises and one million hellos, 
but my sister didn't seem to notice. She didn't so much as look at me as she walked in and dropped off her kid's stuff on the couch next to me. Now, like I said, we weren't close at all, but we weren't on any bad terms. I expected her to at least smile and nod like she normally would, but no, nothing. Somewhat annoyed, I directed all my attention at the kids, listening to the tales of the museum they went to the other day. After some time, I felt as if I got my fill of social activity for the day and went downstairs to the basement, where my room was. It was around 7pm or so now, so I knew the kids would be getting ready for bed soon. I decided I'd keep it quiet down here, as their room was directly above mine. I put on some arrow and began my night of Netflix. About five or so episodes later, I hear a noise coming from upstairs, sort of like someone moving furniture or something like that. It wasn't like a table or anything, though. To me, it sounded like a rug being pulled around. Whatever. Guess she's doing some moving around up there, I think to myself. But then it kept going. It sounded like she moved it all around the darned house. Annoyed, I walked up the basement stairs and opened the door, which led to the kitchen closing it behind me as I walked in. I walk into pure darkness, except for the lighting of three candles all grouped together on the kitchen counter. Save for the small area by where the candles were, I could not see a thing. I turned to my right and began shuffling my hand on the wall, looking for the light switch. Not having much of a sense of where in the kitchen I was, it took a moment. I want to say a solid five seconds after searching for the darned light switch, I heard a whisper coming from the darkness. It was subtle and obviously directed towards me. What are you doing? I heard it say. Looking for the light switch because you only got candles lighting things up in here, I replied, obviously annoyed. Before I could even finish my sentence, however, she cut me off as the last word left my mouth. In what I could describe best as a whisper shout, she replied with, He doesn't like that. You'll scare him off. I ignored her nonsense and eventually found the light switch. Flicking it on revealed the rest of the kitchen, but boy did I wish I left the dang thing off. Felt as if my heart stopped, my eyes widened in pure disbelief as what looked like the body of a dead dog lay on the floor in the middle of the kitchen, sitting in a pool of blood. What the heck? I exclaimed, unable to muster anything else. I backed all the way up against the wall, my back hitting the door as I did. It was the most horrific thing I'd seen in my entire life, until I took my eyes off the body. Turning to look for my sister, I saw her in the doorway that connected the living room and the kitchen, but she wasn't alone. Standing next to her was a man with a hood over his head, Thanks to the light now illuminating the room, I saw his face. He was a pale man, no older than 30, and his mouth was covered in blood. But that wasn't the first thing I noticed. What I first noticed was the way his face was formed. It was weird and unnatural, his forehead huge, his eyes just slits that didn't seem natural at all. He didn't look human. Feeling like I was going to lose my mind, I turned and opened the door behind me and began running down the stairs, fear taking over my body. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life. Halfway down, I heard the chilling and adrenaline-inducing sound of loud footsteps following me down the stairs. I didn't close the door behind me when I left, so it would be easy for whoever was behind me to begin chasing me. This only made me speed up and sprint the rest of the way down, running as fast as I possibly could. At the bottom of the stairs, I didn't even think about turning around to see if I was still being chased, as I could still hear those footsteps following me. I ran down into the basement and quickly into my room, slamming the door behind me and locking the door as I did. Not even two seconds after I locked the door, a loud bang came from it as if someone had run directly into it full force. The flimsy door instantly showed signs of giving in with the assault. I screamed at the top of my lungs, not sure what the heck I was supposed to do. Loud banging and knocking came from the door, and from the sound of it, it was two sets of hands knocking. Thinking on instinct alone, I grabbed my BB gun that sat in the corner of my room. Sure, it was a BB gun, and it wasn't even loaded 
but it sure as heck looked like a real rifle. Anything to defend myself was good. I never considered calling the police as I entered self-defense mode, ready to bluff with this gun the moment that door came down, and it sure as heck seemed close. The banging and yelling increased as I heard my sister yelling things like, open this door, and we just want to talk. But I didn't hear anything from the voice of the man she was with. He remained silent, banging on my door with my sister. I I'm armed. Come in here and I'll blow your freaking head off, I replied. I didn't believe my own threat. It was just a half-cocked yelp in fear. No way someone would take it seriously. But oddly enough, it seemed to work. The banging stopped abruptly. The door, now cracked in the middle, seemed to hold to my surprise. Everything just stopped. Everything had been so heated and intense, then as soon as it began, it just stopped. There was what I thought to be silence for a long while. I then realized the kids had woke up and were now crying out loud. They could be heard clearly even down in the basement. Other than that, there was silence. Then there was a voice. A voice so cold, so chilling, that thinking about it to this day strikes fear into my heart. Our blood isn't the same, but you're still family. I wouldn't consume you, and neither would Thor. I had no reply to my sister's words. The word consumed echoed in my ears, not leaving for the rest of the time we stood at opposite ends of the door. She attempted to sound pleasant, but it only came off as sinister. After a few long moments, I guess they realized I wasn't going to answer. I heard them leave, out of the basement and back up the stairs, the best sound I had ever heard in my life. I dropped the BB gun, and I sat on my bed, attempting to figure out what the heck just happened and if I'd been dreaming the whole time. Obviously, I hadn't been. I couldn't believe anything that just happened, I just couldn't. I didn't sleep for what seemed like hours before the sun came up. I waited for my aunt and her wife to return home and see the mess that was laid out in the kitchen. But to my dismay, that never happened. Instead, they came home to find nothing in the kitchen. It was cleaner than it was when they left. I couldn't believe my eyes. I frantically explained what happened, but without evidence left behind, they didn't believe my story. They assured me it was just a dream. I tried showing them the busted door, but they shrugged it off as the door being flimsy and old, just wear and tear they didn't notice from over the years. There was no way it was just wear and tear. It looked like what one could only explain as a door that almost got busted down on purpose. I saw my sister Crystal only a couple more times over the next year. Each encounter, she acted as though the events of that night didn't happen and in fact, slowly seemed to try and make an effort to become closer to me. Something I was not down for. That fall, I applied and got accepted to a college about two hours away, which is where I live currently. I haven't heard from her since the day before I left for college, where she told me to stay safe because there are a lot of crazies out there. Yeah, trust me, I know. To this day, I wonder if it was all a dream, but thinking back to that busted up door, I know it was definitely not a dream. This past winter break, I decided on staying with a friend as I knew Crystal liked staying at home with my aunt during the holidays. But right around the corner right now is spring break, and I have no place to go but home. I'm hoping it was a one-time deal and I'm praying not to see what I saw that night again, nor the man that she was with. To better understand the next story, I'm going to have to put the first entry to the story, which I narrated over five years ago, right here. Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Submitted by Josh P. Whenever I hear a Mothman story, it tends to be rather personal to me, and even sometimes frustrating, as I've had my own encounter with this creature which is quite different from other stories you may have heard. For context, I grew up in the suburbs of Northern Ohio, right outside some big cities. The thing with Ohio is that you're never more than 20 minutes away from some rural parts. Therefore, I was well-versed in both city and country living. 
My parents, on the other hand, were amateur ghost hunters and frequently went out of town to ghost hunt. One spot they came across was a small city in West Virginia named Point Pleasant. Any fan of cryptozoology or the paranormal would know of this place. So it was no surprise when my parents fell in love with that area. So much so that when I was about 13, my family bought 100 acres of land, a mere 20 or so miles from the town, right along the Ohio River. It was our little retreat where we would go every other weekend to escape the drag of everyday life. Now, our property has much history on it, allegedly. According to legend, a now-dead Shawnee chief cursed our land and the surrounding lands. Ever since we got there, I've heard of a werewolf sighting happening in town just last October, and my mother herself swears she saw a little boy roaming our campsite. But none of these come even relatively close to my encounter with the ominous and legendary Mothman of Point Pleasant. As most of you probably already know, Point Pleasant is one of the first locations the Mothman has ever been seen, for the most part. So it was a must for my family and friends to go out and explore the areas he is said to roam. As practically everyone in our town has had an encounter, we asked around town first for some good leads, and a lot of good online research shows that the Mothman lives in these old World War II bunkers just a few miles north of town. Allegedly, the bunkers were old bomb warehouses in the 40s and 50s, but after the war, the government closed up the bunkers and turned the surrounding land into a state park, patrolled by park rangers. Naturally, we sped through the back roads until we found the park, and after an hour of driving around the forest in broad daylight, we decided to get out and finally walk around. Immediately, we came to these paths with chains going across, eliminating vehicular travel. So we walked through. About a hundred yards down the trail, we came upon a small clearing. Immediately walking into this clearing, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and my heart seemed to skip every other beat. There, on the other side of the small clearing, stood a large concrete bunker, overgrown with the forest around it, like nature had reclaimed its territory. I honestly did not expect to find anything there, so upon seeing this, the story suddenly became that much more real. Gathering our courage, my friend and I walked up to the bunker together, which was clearly padlocked with one of those really heavy solid steel padlocks. The first thing and probably most intimidating thing we noticed was the bright caution sign on the door, warning us of highly explosive contents. That was scary enough in and of itself. But being the idiotic 16-year-old I was, I laughed to my friends to try to impress them, and I put my ear against the solid metal door, listening in for anything. But it was silent. I then grabbed the long metal door handle and shook the door with all of my might. But of course, it barely budged, despite being probably 60 or 70 years old. We took plenty of pictures and then moved to find more bunkers all on separate paths down the road a bit more. Nothing out of the ordinary happened, but for some reason, my mother refused to return to that first bunker we came across. All she would say was that it gave her an uneasy feeling of dread, and she desired to puke the closer she got. This was honestly kind of unnerving to hear. My mother has dealt with far worse things many times before, often with the supernatural, and she has been barely phased by those. But something was different about this place. Beyond that, nothing happened regarding the Mothman for a while. That was until this summer, nearly two years later. This happened about a month and a half ago. Myself and five of my closest friends all went on a camping trip to my parents' property near Point Pleasant in the hopes that we could enjoy one last outing together as most of us were leaving for the military relatively soon. At the time, we were all 18 except for our friend Dylan, who was 25. It was our first night there. We were sitting around the campfire telling jokes and stories, just being average teenagers. All in all, our night was going really well, until about 3 in the morning, when my friend Dylan excused himself to go to the bathroom. The rest of us continued on hanging out and laughing, when a few moments later, 
Dylan returned with a concerned expression on his face. When we asked him what was up, he told us it sounded like a deer was wounded down the slope a little bit. He was a big animal guy, despite being a stone-faced army combat veteran, which made us chuckle a little bit. I told him that as we're on top of a mountain, the sound travels very well and that it was probably nothing, but he insisted that it was nearby and that we had to go check it out. So admittedly a little curious myself, I agreed, and our friends Brian and Luke stayed by the camp while Dylan, Han, Mickey, and myself went over to check it out. As soon as we left the vicinity of the fire, we could hear the groans of a wounded deer carrying through the trees. It did indeed sound close, so we followed the noise until we reached a large ravine with no way across. We stopped to assess our situation and we noticed the cries of the deer had suddenly stopped. In fact, every night creature had stopped making any kind of noise and only the gentle flow of the wind through the trees remained. This creeped us out, wondering if there was a predator nearby as bears, mountain lions, and coyotes and all sorts of poisonous snakes roamed these woods. Dylan and myself thankfully brought guns. He was carrying a 12-gauge Remington shotgun, and I had with me a semi-automatic Colt AR-15, both very capable of handling a bear or mountain lion. After 15 minutes of searching for a way to cross the ravine, we gave up and we began to head back the way we came. But the moment we got about five steps away, the groaning of the deer started again, louder and more drawn out than before, so we turned around, but again it stopped. This irritated my friend Han, who then stomped down toward the edge of the ravine, shining his light below. Just then, his flashlight cut out, and before anyone else could react, we all felt a massive gust of air, along with an enormous presence looming before us but we could see nothing but black. Then the ground beneath me gave out and Han and I found ourselves tumbling down the ravine. We both hit the bottom hard and we got up quickly. We scrambled for the flashlight or the gun or anything to use to feel less defenseless. We could hear yelling and running above us as I scrambled for the rifle. Then it all went by like a blur until we found ourselves back at the top of the ravine gun in hand running back to our campsite. We ran for what seemed like an hour, despite only hiking 15 minutes down the ravine. We both dropped instinctively when a shotgun blast rang through the air, and as we got back up, another shot went off, and another, and then silence. It was only then that I realized my leg was bleeding and Han was crying. We sat for a few moments listening and scanning the trees around us, when suddenly Han grabbed my shoulder and yelled for me to shoot it, just shoot the thing. At that, I sprung around to see two red eyes staring at us from a tall tree. It was only about 200 feet away and 30 feet up. I froze and I was unable to shoot. I was mesmerized by those blood red eyes. They seemed to have a glow about them. My sense of ease scared me even more, and it clearly shook on as he just grabbed my shoulder and ran. We ran as fast as we were humanly capable of until we finally broke onto the ridgeline into the camp where everyone else was already scrambling. Immediately, we packed our things, got into the truck, and peeled out of there as fast as possible. No one spoke the whole way home, and it was only after three days of being back that we asked Dylan what happened with him and Mickey. He said that they began to run back, and upon realizing we weren't following, they turned back, where this thing, as he said, stepped into their path. He said he didn't have time to study its body. All he noticed was its immense height, wings, and those damned red eyes. He said that he thought it was a man, us perhaps, before he noticed those eyes. He said he didn't think, he just reacted and shot at the thing multiple times, then turned back. But Mickey never had a chance to see it like he did. None of us except Han told our parents, and Hans didn't believe him apparently, and now he won't ever bring it up. Since then, 
I've been obsessively researching the Mothman, knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is what we saw in those woods. Since then, my family has returned to our property multiple times, and we've had no weird encounters with the Mothman, surprisingly. Was he hunting us for stalking too close to his home at those bunkers? I don't really know. But I do plan on returning to the bunkers to find out more about this creature. So maybe there will be another tale to tell soon. Though I admit, I get cold sweats now when I simply think about going back there. Mothman Follow-Up A while back, I posted a story detailing my encounter with the ominous Mothman of Point Pleasant. I promised to return to the bunkers from the encounter, and I did. This happened about three or four months after the first incident. None of my friends from the first encounter went back. They either didn't want to go, or they left for the military. So my good friends Alex and Jess volunteered to tag along. Both Alex and Jess have had paranormal encounters of their own, so you could say we were all more or less prepared for the trip. We brought flashlights, a professional-grade camera, survival gear, and paranormal equipment, including my parents' K2 EMF detector, which picked up on electrical and magnetic impulses, generally given off by paranormal entities. At least that's what I read online. We got down to our property, which was about 20 miles from Point Pleasant and the Mothman bunkers. It was about 1 a.m. when we pulled up to the campsite, so it was pitch black. The first thing any of us noticed was the way it felt. The usually peaceful hilltop was silent and eerie. It felt distinctly like something was watching us from the tree line. We grabbed our bags and immediately crowded into the camper, where we locked the doors and drew the shutters. After about an hour, we settled down, forgetting all about that creepy feeling and managing to catch some sleep. At about 6 a.m., I woke up to make some coffee, and I found that Jess was already awake. She asked if I would go outside with her, so she could smoke a cigarette, as we all three agreed not to venture out alone past dark. We sat there watching the sun barely begin to shed its rays over the trees, and we just made small talk. As she finished her smoke, we suddenly heard a light tapping coming from behind the camper, about 15 feet or so to our right. This freaked us both out, and we jumped up, immediately wishing we hadn't left our guns in the camper. As soon as we jumped, the noise stopped, and we heard crashing amongst the bushes behind the camper, as if something was running away from us back into the tree line. We bolted inside and locked the door, not venturing out until the sun was well above us in the sky. For the next couple of days, we wandered the town and our property, learning about colonial history and just enjoying the gorgeous sights. In town, we came across an obelisk where Chief Cornstalk of the Shawnee tribe was buried. He had been murdered by the early colonists, and is said to have originally cursed this land, and many believe his curse gave birth to the Mothman and the tragedies he invokes. We also noticed a prayer stone which was used by the Shawnee to ward off evil spirits with an offering. We kept that in mind if something were to go very bad. Later on, during the third night there, we were looking through the photos we took on the land, and we came across a picture Jess took of some cows on the land. The cows seemed disturbed by something, and as we zoomed in and enhanced, it became overwhelmingly clear that something was there. Something was watching us from the trees and we hadn't even noticed. This shook us with fear, and we stayed up all night researching and pretty much just freaking out over what we have on photo. We decided the next evening we'd go to the bunkers. The following day, we rolled up to the bunkers with all our gear, ready to investigate. It was about 8 o'clock in the evening, and the sun was just beginning to set. We hiked up to the first bunker, where my mother felt the most disturbed with the K2 meter on. It was on the lowest level, meaning electronic and magnetic impulses were low, which was normal for the middle of the woods. As soon as the bunker came into sight, my heart nearly ripped from my chest. The closed and bolted door to the bunker was wide open. At that moment, the K2 meter spiked to the maximum level, meaning there was an extreme presence nearby. 
All my instincts told me to run, but our curiosity pushed us on into the bunker. Inside, the bunker was ice cold, and so dark my flashlight barely cut through the thick air. Jess sat near the door to take pictures, while I dared to venture a little further in. It was super quiet, and every little noise we made was amplified tenfold, echoing throughout the complex. Every picture Jess took sent a shiver down my spine, and we couldn't shake this morbid feeling of dread. Suddenly, there was a crashing of branches from outside. Alex yelled we had to go, so we hurried our way back to the entrance and out to the car, where we finally shook off that feeling of being followed. We decided to try a few more bunkers before we left, but none felt anything like the first. We couldn't shake that eerie feeling, and Alex became increasingly paranoid, which made Jess and I very on edge. As we got back in the car to finally leave, we saw headlights behind us, and as the truck passed by, it slowed to a crawl, but it was too dark to see who was driving. After they passed us, we pulled out to leave the woods when suddenly, we saw the truck's taillights disappear. They didn't shift like it was turning or fade like they turned off. They simply ceased to be there. I didn't believe it, so I floored the gas, speeding up to nearly 60 miles per hour to catch this truck that was going no more than 25 on a straight, flat, narrow road. We made it to the end of the road in no time, but there was no truck. We all felt tingles down our spine. There was nowhere this truck could have turned or gone to escape our view. It just vanished. Nothing made any sense at this point, and as we drove back to the property... We went over every possible scenario that could have happened. The truck, the bunkers, the thing watching us in the distance by the cows. The bunker door looked as if someone or something had ripped it open from the inside, which would have taken an immeasurable amount of force, as outrageous as that may sound. We returned home the next day and looked at all the photos and recordings we took, now completely sure there's something stalking or flying through those darned woods in Point Pleasant. Hat Man from Anonymous I was seven years old when this happened to me. My family and I had just moved into our new house. It was my mother, father, sister, and two brothers. My parents' bedroom had a broken window, so my dad thought it best to sleep in that room by himself while my mom and dust kids slept on a mattress on the floor in the living room. We were really excited to be in our new house. We'd had a long day, so we called it a night and went to bed. A few hours later, I woke up to a noise. It sounded like someone was trying to break into the house. I was so scared I couldn't move. I was able to slightly lift my head when I saw a figure of a man. He had no distinctive features save for the hat he wore. I would describe it as perhaps a fedora. All I saw was a silhouette of a man. He had no other dimensions to him, but I felt evil radiating off of his presence. Fear engulfed me when it felt we had made eye contact. Even without actually seeing his eyes, I realized he was aware of my presence, just like I was aware of his. He was standing in the hall staring down at me. In the hall was a window. He started to bang on the window with one fist, all the while his body and head were still facing my direction. I was able to nudge my sister awake. She was a bit annoyed, but I quickly told her what was happening. I pointed towards the figure. The look on her face was sheer terror. She quickly hid under the blanket, and I followed suit. We continued to hear the noise until sleep caved in. I woke up the next morning, and everything seemed normal. I asked my sister if she remembered last night. She looked at me in a weird and puzzled way, telling me she didn't know what I was talking about. I don't know if she was in denial, or truly didn't remember. All I know is after that experience, more paranormal experiences soon followed up, even to this day. Ghost Town from Anonymous This happened a long time ago, so my memory of it isn't super clear. 
but I remember being quite frightened after something strange happened in my own backyard. I was about eight or nine years old at the time, and my friend and I were hanging out at my house. We were having lunch in the yard on a beautiful sunny fall day. The fence at the time had seen better days, and there were lots of fairly big gaps in it that rabbits and stray cats often went through in and out of the yard. Seemingly instantly, a cloud covered the sun, and a huge gust of cold wind came through, blowing leaves everywhere. Our attention was then drawn to the back alley, where we saw a large dog behind the fence of the yard. The dog's appearance seemed odd. There weren't many dogs in the neighborhood either. If I remember correctly, it was brown and white, and it looked like a smooth collie. Something about it wasn't right, though, and my friend and I were both frightened by its presence. We watched this dog as it walked down the alley, when, all of a sudden, it began trying to get in the yard. It wasn't barking, which in hindsight seems very odd, due to its abrupt aggression. It was viciously snarling and clawing at one of the gaps in the fence, shoving its head inside. This was when we noticed that its eyes were a bright, glowing red. With the only barrier between us being a rickety old fence, we both panicked. We got ready to sprint back inside the house, but as soon as we got up, the dog just stopped clawing at the fence. It then turned away calmly, and just as it appeared, another huge gust of wind went by with leaves everywhere, and it was gone. There was nothing left in the alley besides dead leaves and garbage cans. No trace of that dog, no sounds of it running away. And trust me, it would have had to run to not be seen by us, due to the length of the yard. After it was gone, we took our food back inside, and we did not go back out without our parents with us. I saw the Grim Reaper from Anonymous. My name is Magnus, and I'm from Iceland. I saw the Grim Reaper. In the year 2014, I was 13 years old. My family got a puppy because we thought our old dog was going to pass soon. She was getting weak. She didn't do much anymore, until we got the puppy, who we named Lori. Our older dog, Rose, got better and happier after Lori came to us. It was like Rose thought of Lori as her own pup. After around six months, Lori began having problems. She always had to go to the bathroom to either pee or poo, and I'm talking more than 20 times a day. Her stomach became bloated. We took her to the vet and she gave us some pills, but she didn't get any better after a month or two. We found out that her liver didn't grow. It was apparently infected and was not doing its job properly. We had to take her to a better vet or animal hospital since we lived in a small town. There was just so much a small town vet can do here. Once there, we were told she would have to stay the night. I believed we would take her home the next day or the day after. However, the last night we stayed there, she was put down, since the vet could not do anything for her. We discovered the problem with her liver a little too late. Now, the very same night she passed, I had a very strange slumber. It didn't feel like sleep. It didn't feel like a dream, but I knew I had fallen asleep at some point. Some believe it to be astral projection. Maybe that's what it was. I was in my kitchen all of a sudden. I went to look through the window and I saw Lori running up towards the house, but she wasn't on the ground. She seemed to be floating. She was also transparent. I could see through her. But what I saw coming after her I did not expect. Keep in mind, I had no idea the dog had passed that night. The figure I saw I knew instantly was death. The Grim Reaper. But it wasn't your typical look for the Grim Reaper. It was shorter, like a child in height. It had a white hood and cloak. I could not see any legs either. It still had some flesh on its face and hands, but most of it had rotted away. Lori tried to hide behind me. It didn't seem to notice me. It just went after her. This made me very angry, so I lashed out at the Grim Reaper, trying to punch it. But I was pushed back as Lori ran away. That's when I woke up. I had a weird pain in my back as if I'd just fallen on it. I told my mom about this a year later. She's a little superstitious, 
and I didn't want to worry her at the time. She thinks it appeared white and youthful because Lori was young and had a pure soul. The dream and the picture of that grim reaper is always in the back of my mind. No dream has ever been as vivid and clear as that. Bloody Mary Disaster From Anonymous It was a typical summer day. Me and a few friends of mine were playing late night football in my backyard. Our parents were over at a neighbor's place for a house party. After a while, we decided to go inside. We were browsing the internet, seeing a few people doing the Bloody Mary challenge. It was the usual, people saying her name in the dark bathroom, screaming as they claimed to see her, and then the video ends. My best friend, Josh, smirked and suggested we do the challenge ourselves. Are you crazy? No way. One of my friends, Paris, said. She sounded pretty scared, and I shrugged. Ah, don't worry, it's not real, I stated. Josh chuckled and grabbed a few candles as his cousin Daniel grabbed my dad's camera and turned it on. We got ready and headed into my basement bathroom to make it more creepy. I lit the candles with the lighter I had, then we closed the door and turned off the lights. I sat the candles on either side of the mirror. By then, Josh and Daniel were so excited they were bouncing uncontrollably. I had Paris hold the camera. I still had the football with me and gripped it hard as Josh, Daniel, and I all said her name in unison. After a few seconds, nothing happened, and I sighed. See, Paris, nothing happened, I said. I looked at her. She looked pale, and I looked at her worried. Paris, you okay? Josh asked. We then heard ragged breathing, but it wasn't coming from any of us. It was coming from the mirror. Shakily, we all turned to it, and we saw her. A girl in the mirror, another figure in the room with us, only in the mirror. The girl banged on the glass from the other side as we all screamed. Then I swear she reached out, her nails digging into my football and popping it. We hauled tail out of there, escaping to the neighbor's house. We told my parents and they came straight back to the house. We saw shattered glass from the mirror and a broken camera. My parents were mad. They told me to just stay at Paris' house for the night so they could figure out what to do with me. It's been years since then and I just started college, sharing a house with Paris, Josh, and Daniel. I'd be lying if I didn't admit the feelings of being watched we all have even still, especially when we stand in front of a mirror. The Black-Eyed Boy From Anonymous It happened when I was about eight years old. There were always strange things happening at my grandparents' house, but this one experience still haunts me. My mom had taken me and my brothers and sister to my grandpa's house. Naturally, all of us kids were outside playing, being loud and running around near the woods. As the sun began to go down, I suddenly got a strange feeling that we were being watched. I told my older cousin, but he just brushed it off, telling me to come inside with everyone. So we all hung out in my Uncle Sean's room, playing his old Nintendo or Atari, I can't remember which. After a couple of hours, when it was completely dark out, I got that strange feeling again, and the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I looked over to my cousin, and I was about to say something, when we both looked towards the window. That's when I saw him. A little boy, with pale white skin and deep red hair, was staring at us. The most horrific part about this was his eyes. They were solid black, black as coal, staring back at us. Whenever I looked into his eyes, I felt a wave of negativity and a deep, almost primal fear took hold of me. Just as I was about to scream, my grandpa came running into the room. He glanced at the window, then charged outside, yelling at the boy in Cherokee to go away, that he's bad, that he's not welcome here. I had never seen him so angry in my entire life. After that day, we were not to play outside after dark. I've listened to several black-eyed kids' stories, 
and the one thing that's missing is an accurate description of the fear you feel when you lock eyes with one of these creepy little guys. Sleep Paralysis Experience with the Reaper From Anonymous A few years back, in my late teens, I would suffer from frequent episodes of sleep paralysis. Most of these cases involved me seeing dark, featureless figures, commonly referred to as shadow men, in the corner of my room, accompanied with a heavy feeling on my chest, and I would feel pinned to my bed. The worst of these experiences happened roughly two years ago, and was perhaps the only time in my conscious or unconscious life where I was thoroughly convinced I was going to die. I was sleeping in my bed when I was awakened by the sound of my bedside alarm. This initially confused me as I didn't remember setting an alarm, and it felt way too early in the morning to be waking up. My room was still pitch dark. I removed myself from the warmth of my blanket and rolled sideways to turn off the alarm, which surprisingly was set for 4.30 a.m. I shrugged it off and began to roll back over to sleep. Usually, I sleep on my side, I was rolling over to sleep on my opposite shoulder. However, I was unable to reach that position. I soon realized I was pinned down on my mattress the moment my back was flat on the bed. Unable to move my torso and struggling to breathe, I turned my head back towards the alarm. That's where I saw a figure that I thought was the Reaper himself floating an inch or two above the alarm. In retrospect, this dark thing looked and behaved more like a Dementor from Harry Potter. I began to shake and fight violently against what felt like an invisible three-ton truck on my chest as the dark figure began inching closer and closer to me. I remember feeling a sense of dread, convinced that I would forever be stuck in this nightmare if I didn't manage to escape before this thing reached me. Thoughts of my family and loved ones waiting for me on the other side of my consciousness flashed before me, motivating me to fight harder against the weight on my chest. The thing was now right next to me, and it began to whisper something in my ear, just as I was able to break free from the invisible chains and wake up from my nightmare. I awoke in a panic to find myself in my pitch black room, my bed and body soaked with sweat. I immediately rolled over to check my alarm, and was horrified to find that it had indeed been set to ring at 4.30 a.m. A cold feeling of utter dread suddenly filled my body, and I didn't manage a single minute of sleep for the rest of the night. The most horrifying thing about this so-called dream was that I felt the reaper-like thing had used the alarm to bait me into its ambush. It was like it knew I was safe from its clutches, so long as I was wrapped up underneath my blankets. It used the alarm to lure me out of my safety. Fortunately, this was the last of these experiences I've had in a while, but I still often check my alarm before going to bed to see if it had been set at a strange time by something. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com, such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.